Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted that you're joining us tonight. My name is John Kerwin. I'm assistant professor of theology at the University of St. Thomas in Houston and director of the online and on-campus MA in theology program. Welcome to the first annual Truth and Tradition online summer lecture series sponsored by the grad program in theology at the University of St. Thomas. Tonight, we're, we're delighted to welcome you to the fourth installment of this series. Every Wednesday night throughout the summer, we'll be streaming theology talks live on Zoom, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. And all of these links can be found on our website, realtheologyust.com. Um, you can also like and follow our Facebook page. We'll be reposting these videos. If you miss them, they'll be here. They'll, they'll be on Facebook. Uh, to view later, and as well as on our YouTube channel, UST Theology. And you can also uh, follow, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you'll get all the, the updates and the new videos. We'll be uh, posting co content throughout the summer and throughout the year. Uh, let's begin in, in a short prayer before we welcome our guest tonight. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, I'm delighted to welcome our, our, our distinguished guest tonight, uh, my colleague, Dr. Charles Summer. Dr. Charles, Dr. Summer is a native Houstonian and grew up in the Sugarland area. He earned his BA, BA in philosophy from UST, then went to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. for his MA and PhD in biblical studies. He joined the USC theology faculty in the fall of 2005 and has served as a freshman advisor and also mentor for the freshman symposium Odyssey class. He was the interim director of the graduate program in, the, in theology for the spring semester of 2019 and took over as department chair in August of 2020. He currently is working on a study of the poetic structure of the Psalms and an article on the theology of the sacrament of marriage. He has his wife, he and his wife, Christina, are members of St. Joseph Parish in Baytown. Dr. Summer, we're delighted to have you with us. Dr. Summer will be speaking to us tonight, tonight on Benedict the 16th and how to read the Bible. Dr. Summer, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Dr. Kerwin. All right. Um, let's just make sure that I'm, I'm good on volume. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. yep. good. Sounds good. Okay, good. I, I love online materials. All right. So what I would like to propose to you today is a, uh, and, and John, I, I, I don't want to get in trouble with you, but uh, sometimes philosophers even if they're wrong, a lot of the times can get something right. And what I'd like to propose to you is actually something along the lines of a Hegelian dialectic that's going on within biblical studies, particularly Catholic biblical studies. Uh, and we're seeing it today, especially in the work of uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Let me explain that for a second. Um, you can look at the historical critical method and this particular almost secular way of reading the Bible. It has a long history of development. If you're interested in that, I've got some books for you. Um, but suffice it to say by the 1800s, this is in full swing. And the church actually put a break on it for a while. Why? Because it was very secularizing. It was very much in the modernistic um, denial of absolute truths, denial of truths within Christianity. And so various popes over the years said, no, let's not do this. That changed with Pius XII. In 1943, Pius XII published an encyclical, Divino Aflante Spiritu, which gave permission for biblical critics, exegetes within the Catholic Church, to start using historical criticism. And one of the reasons he did this was he saw some of the fruit coming out of it. Again, just because something is bad a lot of the time doesn't mean it doesn't get a few things right. And what he wanted to try to do was establish a, a 
a modern way of looking at the Bible within Catholic and within Catholic circles. And not to have a dichotomy between scientific exegesis on the one hand and spiritual interpretation on the other. To see if we could read it with both sides. What happens, and this takes a while because it's in the middle of World War II, um, it takes a while, but that first generation of scholars who, Catholic scholars who embrace this, who are trained in historical criticism, people like Raymond Brown, Joseph Fitzmeyer, John P. Meyer, they embrace it wholeheartedly. Now, they remain faithful. Um, they remain faithful to the church, and so they don't quite embrace all of historical criticism, and I'll explain that in a minute. But I think one of the one of the more interesting things is uh, John Meyer's uh, comments at the beginning of A Marginal Jew, and this kind of sets up both the problems and the promise of uh, historical criticism. Meyer, in his introduction to volume one, there's five volumes out now. It's called the book is the series is a marginal Jew to study of Jesus from the perspective of the New Testament. Apparently, he's working on volume six. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know what it's about. But in his introduction to volume one, Meyer says the plan of attack, so to speak, and the, the plan for the study is basically if you locked people, scholars of various um, beliefs, non-beliefs, religious affiliation, etc. So some rabbis, some uh, imams, uh, some Catholic scholars, Protestant scholars, even Buddhists and Hindus, and you lock them on the library, what would they come up with? This is both what's good and what's bad about historical criticism. It is trying to be as historically grounded as possible and as objective as possible. That's a good thing and a bad thing. Okay. I'll come back to that in a second. So that was that first generation. And give you another example, Raymond Brown, I just flipped through in prep for this talk. I flipped through his uh, first volume, his introductory materials uh, in his commentary on John. And in his, all of his bibliographical stuff, it's all modern. It's all 18th century or later, uh, maybe a 17th century, but 18th century or later, 19th century scholars. Very few uh, quotations, very few references to patristic authors. Okay, That's the kind of move you see in that first generation. And I think it's something that we're coming out of, and it's something that we're uh, going to come to grips with. And I think we see that in Benedict. So, but before we get to Benedict himself, um, one other thing happens in the midst of all of this, and that's Vatican II. Don't have time to get into everything that Vatican II said or didn't say, but I'd like to concentrate on the, um, the document on Revelation. Dei Verbum was the first one uh, put to the Council Fathers. It was immediately released. The first draft was immediately rejected. It was the last one approved in 1965. I won't say it doesn't have some flaws. It probably does. But on the whole, it's a very balanced look at the uh, what revelation is, God's self-disclosure to man out of love. And within that, of course, is not only tradition, but also scripture. And one of the things that, that Dave Verbum is really good about is making sure that we understand that the Bible is the word of God. Yes, it is an inspired text, but it's the word of God in human words. And just to quote something out of paragraph 12 here, seeing that in sacred scripture, God speaks through human beings in human fashion. It follows. So then, then it comes our, our job. It follows that the interpreters of sacred scripture, if they are to ascertain what God has wished to communicate to us, should carefully search out the meaning which the sacred writers really had in mind, the me that meaning which God had thought well to manifest through the medium of their words. This not just opens the door or continues to open the door to historical criticism, it almost begs us to do it. Historical criticism in and of itself is designed to take the, the word as 
it was written and explain it in the context it was written. Dave Verbum also says that God chose these men to write and that they used all of their faculties in order to compose the sacred books. That means their writing style, their temperament, their, um, their presuppositions, their own knowledge of history and what's going on. Now, granted, there's the work of the Holy Spirit to make sure that what they're saying is in line with God's uh, purpose for this writing. But it's, it's a human being writing. And that's what historical criticism was meant to do. It was meant to get us to the point where we see what these texts were as human artifacts. A human person put pen to paper, we can examine that. Okay? So that's part of our, that's part of our look. How do I want to say that? That's part of our, our job, is to figure out what this meant at the time. That's from paragraph 12. Also from paragraph 12, though, it, the, the Council Fathers give exegetes norms for interpretation, guidelines, guideposts. The first was that we have to pay attention to the unity of Scripture. It's not just taking something out of context, that's bad but it's also situating a text within the context of the whole, whether it's the whole book, whether it's the Old Testament, whether it's the Bible as a whole. So it doesn't just speak to, you know, the, the, the Emmanuel uh, prophecy of Isaiah 7 doesn't just speak to the king at the time. It does and promises him a child that will be the pro that will herald the prosperity of his kingdom in the midst of siege and war. But it also looks ahead to the virgin will be with child and will call his name Emmanuel. So there, there is that look forward to the New Testament and to Christ, but there's also that historical context of what did this mean at the time Isaiah was saying it. We have to pay attention to that. The second thing they asked us to pay attention to was the living tradition of the whole church. We cannot simply approach scripture in a vacuum. I mean, scripture scholarship isn't only 200 years old. A lot's been written in 200 years, don't get me wrong, but it's not just 200 years old. Um, you know, uh, I was reading through some patristic stuff and it's um, Clement's first letter where he addresses the age of Isaac when he is being offered up as a sacrifice or before he's being offered up as a sacrifice. We think of him as a teenager or a preteen. Um, Clement argues that he is he is in his 30s. Uh, this goes actually with some Jewish traditions as well. But notice how that changes it. He's now a willing sacrifice. He's not simply a kid caught up in this. He is a willing sacrifice like Christ will be later in the New Testament. And if we ignore the, the 200 years, if we ignore the 2,000 years, where this Bible has been read and interpreted doesn't mean we agree with everything, but if we ignore that, we're impoverishing ourselves. And the third thing is that we should show respect for the analogy of faith. What does that mean? It means we cannot simply be neutral when it comes to Scripture. We have to interpret, say, for example, the brothers and sisters of Jesus that you find throughout in the New Testament in light of the dogma of the perpetual virginity. Okay? If this is revelation from God, and it is true, and sacred tradition is revelation from God, and is true, the two cannot be in contradiction. And then we have to look at those options once we see an apparent contradiction. One of the things that I find fascinating is Dei Verbum kind of encapsulates everything so much so that John Paul II, who wrote on everything during his pontificate, partly it was long enough, had no encyclical. He had no writing about either revelation or scripture. I think he looked at Dave Verbum and said, that's good, let it go. Now, there, he did have some discussions. He did talk about, uh, there were some um, exhortations, etc. But nothing like uh, Fides et Ratio or some of the others that he is famous for. 
So now let's look at Benedict. There are two documents that I want to kind of point us to, well, one document and one book, I should say. The first document is actually the, the largest document since Vatican II, and actually it's longer than Dei Verbum. It was published in September 2010 by Benedict. It's called Verbum Domini, and it's his post-synodal uh, apostolic exhortation. So the Synod of Bishops had gathered together. They talked about the Bible for a while. They put some stuff to Benedict, and a year or so later, he came out with this particular exhortation. Now, and it, a lot of it is rehashing of what is in De Verbum, but I'd like to point out a couple of things that he writes. The first is in paragraph 19. He's talking about inspiration of Scripture. And I think this is important for our topic tonight. Here, too, we can suggest an analogy. As the word of God became flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so sacred scripture is born from the womb of the church by the power of the same spirit. Sacred scripture, here quoting, is the word of God set down in writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In this way, one recognizes the full importance of the human author who wrote the inspired text, and at the same time, God himself as the true author. And so this, um, this understanding of Scripture as both from God and from man, how do we look at this in terms of God's inspiration? How do we look at this in terms of the historical context that these texts were written. Again, historical criticism, what we have today to examine that literal text, as well as the tradition that is going on, that, that um, notice, sacred scripture is born from the womb of the church. So how has the, this is a document, not just of God, but of, and not just of the human being, but given to the church, written by the church, and so what does that mean? That means we have to look at it in the context of the church, from the living tradition, the analogy of faith. A little later, he addresses the, the issues with historical criticism, just, just because I'm, I'm trained in it, and just because I know how to use these this technique, the problems are still there. We have to be aware of the issues that this rationalistic view of the Bible can, you know, can go. The presuppositions can still be used and used against the Bible. And so in section 35 of the same book, or the same exhortation, he talks about, gives us a warning, so to speak. And basically what he says is, do not treat the Bible in a dualistic fashion. Don't break apart the work of the Spirit and the work of the human being. So on the one hand, we cannot treat the text as if it only belongs to the past. Yes, it is a historical document. Yes, it was written at a particular time for a particular purpose, but its meaning also should have meaning for us today. Okay. And then if we do go, we do push it that far. And we lose what he calls a hermeneutic of faith, an approach to scripture that is faithful to the tradition, faithful to the teaching. That if we if we take that hermeneutic away, one has to take its place. And that becomes a positive, positivistic and a secularized hermeneutic. Basically, if you take the faith out, something's got to fill its place. And what will fill its place is a completely secularized version of interpretation that removes God, that removes miracles, because for the secularized individual, it's it's ra it's rational, it's explainable, everything can be, and so you explain away the miracles, you explain away the work of God, and in the end, that can lead to a doubt on the fundamental mysteries of faith. Was the incarnate? Was there an incarnation? Was there salvation? It takes this out of the view of a, uh, a cooperation between God and man. 
and puts it solely as a work of a human being. But in the end, we can't rule out God. If this text is to mean anything, let's to be honest, if this text is to hang together as a, not just 73 or 66 separate books, but as one book, as one message from God to man, you have to have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that's the warning. In a sense, use historical criticism, but don't let it be the be-all and end-all of the um, of our approach to Scripture. So that was Benedict acting as Pope. That was Benedict acting as pastor, explaining. The other text I'd like you to consider here is his three-volume set on Jesus of Nazareth. At the very beginning of um, the first volume, Benedict lays out, because he started this actually before he became Pope, he lays out the fact that he is writing as a theologian, not as a Pope. So whatever authority he has as Bishop of Rome, he is setting aside for a minute, and he is speaking to scholars and to believers as a theologian, which means what? We can disagree with him. He's not trying to speak definitively on matters of faith and, and morals. That being said, I think we have a duty and obligation to look exactly at how he does this, because even if some of the conclusions that he reaches may be open to debate, and I think some of them are, not many, but some of them are, his method, his approach to it, I think that is part of his magisterial teaching, not explicitly, but by example. And so right at the very beginning, in, on, in page 15 of his introduction, he starts and says, the historical critical method, specifically because of the intrinsic nature of theology and faith, is and remains an indispensable dimension to, of exegetical work. For it is of the very essence of biblical faith to be about real historical events. End quote. One of the things that sets Judaism and Christianity apart from other faiths, other philosophies, is the reliance on history. It's not simply about the Bible. The Bible is simply a record. It's a history of how God has interacted with human beings from the very beginning, from the fall through Abraham and the formation of Israel as a light to the nations, then at the Pentecost, um, that uh, distribution of the Spirit, not simply to Israel, but to broaden that kingdom of God to the other nations, so that in the end, that great crowd in heaven proclaiming the, the glory of God will be of every tongue and nation and will be countless, right, from the book of Revelation. So because this is about historical events, again, it goes back to the fact that, you know, so it's a, it's event, as Dave Verbum put it, it's both the event, what God does, and what God has said. And it's the two working together. Because it's about history, we can approach it as a historical text, or we can, for those that aren't historical texts, say the Psalms, we can approach them with an eye to what was happening when these texts were written. Now, even though you have to do that, excuse me, Benedict also warns a voice, sorry, that we have to recognize the limits Historical criticism is about the past, and it keeps the text in the past. It cannot by itself make it into something present today. And because it's also in the past, it gives us hypotheses. It's not always about certitudes. Okay? When we take the next step, when we bring it into today, when we, when we bring in the spiritual dimension, when we bring in the tradition of the church and the rule of faith, that's when we get the certitude rather than hypotheses. And just to give you a, a small example of that, um, some of my work has been on the book of Sirach. If you've never read it, it's long, but very beautiful, very, uh, very good 
wisdom text. It's also deuterocanonical. So um, nobody knows it, nobody reads it. Anyway, so actually some nice passages on friendship. Um, but one of the things that happens in Sirach is that unlike a lot of the other wisdom texts, the author of Sirach chooses not to be or not to write as Solomon. Okay. Uh, Wisdom of Solomon, for example, the author is trying to show you that he is writing as the great king in Israel's past, the great wise king in Israel's past. It's not Solomon. How do I say that definitively? It was written in 100 BC and in Greek. Okay. It's not the great king, but it's a literary move to put that king's name on it. Sirach, on the other hand, avoids Solomon's name, partly because he thinks he is a failed sage. He was wise at one point, but he gave up his wisdom and was condemned for it and broke the kingdom apart. So if you think he was a failed sage, you don't take his name on. Well, I think one of the consequences, and I can't prove this, but I think one of the consequences of that particular move, that literary move of not keeping the name of of the king and writing as his own person means he didn't make it into the Hebrew canon. Theologically, I think the rabbis agreed with him, but they could not, they could not accept him as an ancient work, as someone of antiquity and therefore not inspired, not prophetic. Okay. But that's a hypothesis. I I can, I think I can prove it, but there's still some question about it. That's the limit of historical criticism. But one of the things that he says in the end of this, though, in the end of that introduction is, a voice greater than man echoes in scripture's human words. So we can't simply look at the human scripture. We have to have God in there. So really quickly, I want to go through... um, how he develops this kind of gives us the uh, the how and the why or the how of this. And so I'm going to take volume one of uh, Jesus of Nazareth and particularly his chapter on the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Because I think in that you see this amalgamation, you see this um, blending of both historical criticism and the tradition. So he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel and then the corresponding passages in Luke and how that this, because Jesus goes up onto the mountain, that this is about a question of law, a question of the Torah. This is Jesus' own law, his spin on Mosaic law. And of course, at the beginning, he talks about the Old Testament parallels that you have between what Jesus does and what Moses does, how he Jesus is that reflection of Moses, again, bringing in that unity of Scripture. And when he gets to the Beatitudes, that opening passage of the sermon, and he's talking about the poor in spirit, and the, the, the Lucan version where it's blessed are the poor, not just poor in spirit, but materially poor. And as he's going through all the permutations, Eventually, he gets to the point, and he says, well, let's talk about poverty. And he talks about the the example of Francis of Assisi. And he starts that section by saying, you know, the saints are the true interpreters of Holy Scripture. And the way that that Francis lived out his poverty, uh, including being vested by the bishop after discarding all of his clothing, and using that, that poverty to advance the gospel, to preach the gospel, that that is, in the end, and uh, one, I don't know if we're all called to quite do that, but it's also something that is a complete imitation of Christ. Francis shows us what that radical poverty can be. Then as he goes through, actually towards the end of the section, And he's talking about the various points where Jesus corrects the law, so to speak. It was said to your ancestors, do not murder. I say to you, do not be uh, angry at your brother. 
do not call him fool, etc. Or do not have lust, or do not commit adultery, it was said. I say to you, whoever looks at someone with lust in their heart, okay, has committed adultery. And as he gets into this, he discusses details, and he talks about recently scholarly exegesis about the law code in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And in that data, it's clear that what you have in the Torah is casuistic law, legal arrangements for very specific issues. What happens if an ox gets out of its pen and gores someone to death? Okay. Do you hold the owner um, liable or not? Well, it depends. And there are very specific issues and very specific conditions for all of these things. Or what happens if you get robbed and you catch the guy in the act? Is it daylight or is it nighttime? And there's all kinds of arrangements. And what these recent scholars have said, have looked at these laws and said, look, we're seeing development in the Old Testament. These laws are all presented as if they come from Moses, but we can see a development over time reflecting the value of Israel and how things have changed. And Benedict then goes on and says, well, and it's not just confined within the law code. On page 124, he writes, as Oliver Artus and others have shown, there is a sense in which the prophetic critique found in Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, and Micah is also aimed at casuistic law. It's not just a critique of the society itself, but in some of the laws, picking up there, that although it is contained in the Torah, this casuistic law, it has in practice be become a form of injustice. So there was a reinterpretation of the law, even among the prophets, not the grand scheme, the moral laws, the Ten Commandments, the, the love of God and love of neighbor, but in how those things worked out. And he concludes this by saying, so Jesus isn't breaking ground here. He's pointing the children of God in the way to be perfect. Quote from 126, Jesus contrasts the practical casuistic norms developed in the Torah with the pure will of God, which he presents as the greater righteousness. So yes, not committing adultery, really good thing. What's even better? Not treating the other as an object. Because when you start to treat someone as an object, then you start to treat them in ways that will lead you into adultery. It's not simply what comes from the outside which defiles. It what, it's what comes from the inside. Holding on to anger, for example, as opposed to forgiving, isn't literal murder but it damages the soul and leads to things like murder, injury, assault. Okay? And so what's Jesus, on the one hand, what Jesus is doing isn't all that radical. It is within the Old Testament scheme of things. But then he shows the radicalness of it, Benedict does. And you have to back up a few pages on here is when he first starts talking about the Torah and the law, he enters into a dialogue not with the tradition, not with modern scholarship, but actually with Judaism. And in this case, he strikes up a dialogue with Jacob Neusner. He was a rabbi, prolific author, passed away a few years ago. Um, and in particular, the book that Neusner wrote on um, A Rabbi Speaks to Jesus. This was written as a fictional dialogue between the author and Jesus in the first century. And Neusner writes it to help Christians understand Judaism and Judaism to understand Christianity. It's a two-way street. He is as honest as he can be. And in the end, he says he would, he would have rejected the teaching of Jesus because he does, he goes too far in his explanation of the Torah. And actually what, what Neuser says is he places himself within the Torah. It's not simply God speaking to us. It's Christ speaking to us in the Torah. So, for example, 
It was said to your ancestors, do not murder. I say to you. Even Moses, when he presents the law to the people, says, this is what I got from God. Jesus doesn't do that. This is why he teaches with authority and why he astonishes the crowds of that. Because he said, he's not just, this is what God has said. No, I say to you. And there are other instances of this, and I, I encourage you to, to look at Neusner's book uh, on this, because it's a fascinating dialogue, and it's a way of seeing. Now, if Christ isn't who he says he is, as we believe him to be God, then what he is saying is, yes, blasphemous and, and, and radically different from what we find in Jewish thought, in what is allowed in Judaism. The Torah is perfect. It's not to be changed. It's given to Moses from God. We are here to interpret it. But Jesus says, no, I am the one who is the lawgiver. More, even more than Moses. I'm not having to go up to the mountain. I have, you know, the Father and I are one, as it says in John's Gospel. So what I give to you, I have gotten from the Father. And I am able to legislate. In a sense, Jesus has become a prophetic interpreter of the Torah. So notice what, and this is why I said there's, there's a dialectic here. Before, um, before Pius XII, you had a certain way of reading the Bible. In that first generation after Pius XII, Catholic scholars went to the academy, got trained in historical criticism, and were given those tools and employed those tools, but they didn't quite integrate the first part. What Benedict is doing is he's taking those tools. Let's understand these words of men, but let's also look at tradition. Let's also look at rabbinic exegesis because they have a value in how they read the Bible. And let's bring in our faith. Let's not take this as a completely objective way of doing this. And so the synthesis is historical criticism on the one hand, but that traditional way of looking at, say, the spiritual senses described in the catechism, the anagogical, the, uh, uh, the moral sense. This is embarrassing to forget that one. Allegorical, sorry. Um, I came up with allegor. I couldn't come up with allegorical. I got, I got anagogical. I never use anagogical in my own stuff. It's just too hard for me. Anyway, but to use those spiritual senses, to give that can canonical way of looking at it, to put it in the context of not just this one passage, because historical criticism loves to atomize things. It loves to chop it up but not just to chop it up, to, to bring it back together. And so while Benedict has this practice, and you can see it in his work, um, in his exegesis, particularly in Jesus of Nazareth, you see it in other uh, more recent com Catholic commentators of Scripture. I'm thinking of uh, the scholars at the Augustine Institute or the St. Paul Center um, out of Steubenville, uh, Scott Hahn, Brant Petrie, um, uh, Dr. Shri, uh, there are other names I'm forgetting. Um, they are not just doing historical criticism. They are bringing in the traditional views. And I think as we approach scripture, we can't simply look at 200 years. We have to make it broader. Okay. There will be a time and a place for these, these ways of approaching scripture. So for example, um, Dr. Kerwin mentioned my, my work on the Psalms. My work on the Psalms, the initial project is a deep dive into the, the structure and um, the, the, how the Hebrew poetry is really working in these Psalms. Eventually, if I can get that far, then I'll start bringing in how this approaches how we can look at, say, the New Testament in relation to Psalm 22, or uh, the connection of Melchizedek between Genesis, Psalm 110, Christ in the Gospels, and the letter to the Hebrews. Those are, that's the next step. 
the first part is understanding how the Psalms work in their context, in their, uh, in their publication. Then we broaden. I want to lead you with, leave you with one quote here to kind of conclude. And this is in Benedict's introduction to volume two, which is on the infancy narratives volume. So volume one is about the public ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Volume two is the um, infancy narratives. Volume three is about the passion narratives. Okay. So you can read one part for ordinary time, one part for Advent, one part for uh, Lent. But he says on pages 14 and 15, the following. One thing is clear to me. In 200 years of exegetical work, historical critical exegesis has already yielded as its, its essential fruit. Essential, yes, I think we can still fill in the details. Continuing. If scholarly exegesis is not to exhaust itself in constantly new hypotheses, becoming theologically irrelevant, it must take a methodological step forward and see itself once again as a theological discipline without abandoning its historical character. It must recognize that a properly developed faith hermeneutic is appropriate to the text and can be combined with a historical hermeneutic, aware of its limits, so as to form a methodological whole. We approach the scripture as scholars to find out what was said, but also to link it back to the faith. We have to be theologians not simply exegetes. All right. I thank you for uh, your attention. I'll turn it back over to John. And, uh, I think we Dr. have some questions. Dr. Silver, fantastic. Um, we will, if you have any questions, and of course, this is for those of you who are on Zoom. Um, if, if you, we do have a few assistants who are helping out. So if you're on YouTube or Facebook, you could throw a question into the chat and uh, one of them might be able to pick it up and, and feed it to us. So you can also do it that way, but obviously the Zoom, the Zoom people, uh, we, we see these questions right away. So thank you so much. So if, if you have a question, throw it in there. Um, wh why don't I start it off? So I really appreciate that. I mean, we can't really talk about Dei Verb 12 enough and especially linked with Dei Verb 11, right? Um, yeah. So, so what do we do? So for example, you know, Benedict the 16th has um, some, you know, some, some quite profound reflections on the provisional character of the historical critical method, as important as it is, as it's indispensable as it is, he says it, yeah. right? Nonetheless, you know, since Ray Morris and the birth of the first Jesus quest, there's kind of this, this, this uh, graveyard of, of bad discarded historical theories, you know, and Benedict is even generous. And he says, you know, well, we needed the, we, we had to go through this phase to get where we are, you know, which we could, you know, which I guess would be up for some debate, but what, what do we do when, yeah. Given Benedict's reflection on the provisional character of the of historical research, when the magisterium seems to conflict with uh, certain conclusions that the historical method draws about X, Y, and Z chapter verse uh, of scripture, I think that's where the the you mentioned Dave Verman twelve. I think that's where twelve chapter twelve comes in, and particularly those norms. We, you know, if there is something that is goes against the rule of faith, and we have to we have to back up and and go, wait, what? Um, and I'll, I'll give you a concrete example on this. And by the way, that just because we say wait, what doesn't mean that everything that is produced in the study is wrong. It simply means where they diverge then we have problems. And again, my concrete example is I taught, and I probably don't know if I want to admit this, um, but I taught the Book of Revelation course uh, a few summers ago uh, that we offer. And I had a commentary that I used in for, actually had you know read it for a class before, and it came from, it was a well-respected, you know, relatively faithful, um, commentary series on the book of revelation i assigned it and about halfway through the class i realized his discussion of um, say the last four chapters went completely off the rails um this particular scholar uh was arguing for a combination of if i remember right either universalism so everybody is saved or self-annihilation 
So God actually doesn't condemn you to the lake of fire. You do, and you wink yourself out of existence or something along those lines. Now, it was a, it was a learning tool for both me and for the students because I said, okay, bracket out this, this last part because this is wrong. And we went through, here's what he's arguing for. Here's where he's wrong. But I said, the, the conclusions of the first part, the, the actual nitty gritty of the first half, first three quarters of the book in terms of interpreting the text, that sounded really good. It's when he went to the theology, um, particularly of the, of the last things that he went off the rails. So you can have that kind of, of dichotomy where you, you find what's good and useful and use it, but then you have to have that, those breaks of the rule of faith to kind of bring you back. And I mean, it's the same thing that, that the patristic authors did with Plato and Aristotle, right? You know, you take what's valuable from the pagan philosophers. We, we take the gold from Egypt, as Augustine said, we pillage Egypt and we use that for, for what truths can be found. But then when they, if it's dross, you get rid of it. Um, and that's 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 the harder part to do. Um, I mean, I think the other the other thing that we have to be wary of is historical. Sometimes scholars try to build up things that are not necessarily <clears throat> things solidify. What should be a hypothesis becomes dogma, secular dogma. Um, the two source theory and synoptic gospels uh, for a long time, the documentary hypothesis within the Pentateuch. Now that one's kind of being dismantled, um, but like the two source theory, it, it can, you know, and, and what you do with Q and how the relation of the synoptic gospels, um, the, that interrelationship of the gospels is fun and it's fascinating. And it's kind of cool to look at when it becomes dogmatic and you're locked into one view that becomes a problem when it, completely when you lose sight of the fact that these are individual gospels written for individual communities that's when it takes a step too far okay and so you have to look at matthew as it was written it's the it's the gospel of jesus according to saint matthew we need to take that into account and so you have to te treat these not just as an agglom you know conglomeration of texts but as individual speakers writing to individual audiences so I, those are the two kind of um, tendencies that I've seen over the years that we kind of need to back away from. So, excellent, thank you. Uh, the, well, the Q the Q source is interesting, right? I mean, twenty years ago, if you would have showed up to right the SBL conference and been a Q denier, you would have been kind of on the fringes. But now, kind of post Mark Goodacre, right? You can actually yeah. right, right you can actually be kind of considered a, a you know rational sentient human being. <laughs> <laughs> and, I would, and for those of you who don't know Q, it's not QAnon. This is not internet conspiracy <laughs> theories. So, um, and but and then to to go back to that, not just that. It's um, I had a colleague years ago as part of a search committee, basically say if you didn't agree with two source theory, said colleague would not recommend for the job. Um, <laughs> So that, that kind of dogmatism, even within secular uh, scholarship, can be problematic. And you're right. I, I'm kind of glad it's getting picked apart because I think it went too far. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, it's one of those few ready for another question? Sure. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much from Michael. Are you able to speak a little bit about the books that are mentioned in the Bible but are not included in the Bible? One instance might be when 1 Kings 11.41 says the rest of the Acts of Solomon with all that he did and his wisdom are recorded in the book of the Acts of Solomon. Yeah. Um, okay, so those, the, particularly the references you find in 1 Kings, uh, both books of Kings, to the other Acts of the King found in the Annals of the King, what these seem to be are royal archives. Um, so, you know, mo, you know, a king like Solomon, Josiah, Hezekiah, they get several chapters, right? I mean, Solomon has, what, 11 chapters in 1 Kings, 12 chapters, something like that. Um, and 
but some of those other, you know, some of the other kings only get a paragraph. Why? Because it wasn't uh, the historian who's writing the text doesn't want to overburden it. He's got a he's got an objective. He's he's telling the story, you know, from from the entrance into the promised land to the exile. And while he's doing that, he, he kind of has to minimize his, his, you know, he can't write too many things. And so what he's doing is he encapsulates, he tells you what, what the king was, how long he reigned, and he gives you a moral judgment on the king. But for the most part, he's not going to tell you everything he did. So what is he doing? He's pointing you to these royal annals. He's saying, if you want to do further research, look here. Now, what can we say about that? Because they were lost to history, they were, for whatever reason, they are not inspired texts. I would have loved, to, anybody in the field would love to get our hands on these things. Um, they were probably destroyed shortly after the exile. And partly, but it's, they were, you know, they were, one, they were probably boring to read because um, it's just so-and-so did this. He decreed this. This is this happened. This happened. These are the taxes collected for the year, that kind of thing. Fascinating to rebuild the history of Israel, but not theological, not inspired. And so when you see references to these things, then you say, well, okay, that doesn't quite work. Um, you know, for whatever reason. And again, remember what happens to canon? How does the canon develop? The canon develops out of usage. Why are they used? They are used because the community, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, sees in this communication from God. So if it's just a list of what the kings did and how they acted, or, you know, they're, they're you know, you know, the royal archives, not everybody's going to read them, and they're certainly not using them liturgically. So they get kind of pushed to the wayside, and we get these tantalizing clues. It also means that our author of Kings did his research. He was looking this stuff up, okay, because he obviously didn't live through it all. Um, but, um, but he's also, he had access to them, and notice his view of them is through the lens of God. God is give, his inspiration is allowing him to take out of those archives what's important for the story to give to the people. And that's what he puts down under inspiration. Hope that helps. Yeah, I wish we had those things. It would be fascinating to read, but okay. N next question. And this is a bit related sure. to that. So given you know the late okay. dating of some of the books of the old testament, such as you mentioned, Sirach and and okay. uh, I mean, how do we defend the authority of the and, and the authenticity of the canon? How do we defend the author? <sighs> the best way to answer this question is the church has been guided by the spirit over the years. That's that's the easiest answer. Um, and local bishops over the years read allowed these particular books to be read in church communities. Why? Because they were edifying for the faith. And so something like Sirach, which was written in 190 BC thereabouts, okay, doesn't meet the requirements, quote unquote, for the Jewish canon. But Christians who looked at it said, this sounds really good. It's really faithful. It points us to Christ. Now, I will say, I think Sirach got a couple of things wrong, but that's a different story. Um, even though he's an inspired writer, he still has his own prejudices. For example, I really do believe Sirach thought the Davidic covenant was over, um, that the heirs of David had lost it. Um, clearly, he was wrong on that, but hey, you know, overall, he sees authority in the figure of the high priest. Well, why is it included in the canon? Well, because Jesus isn't simply Davidic king. He is also high priest. And so it gives us that movement of king to priest and the combination of the two roles. And so we have to trust the judgment of the church. I mean, when Augustine and Jerome are writing letters back and forth in the fourth century and Jerome saying the rabbis don't use these, Augustine responds, we've been reading them for 300 years. What's wrong with them? <laughs> you know, 
And so I think the historical usage with, you know, combining that with the movement of the spirit within the church, I think that's, that's the key. Um, if you're really interested in this, um, a writer by the name of Albert Sundberg, um, and I'd have to dig out, he wrote in this, the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, I'm trying to remember the volume, um, but if anybody's really interested, shoot me an email. I can send you the I can send you the the PDF of the article. Um, he's a Protestant scholar, and he takes apart the canon and the, the claim the pro, actually the Protestant claims for a shorter canon. And in the end, he says, and this was you know 30 years ago. I think he worked on it, just never came up with it. You know that the Protestant churches has have to um, either come up with a better justification for a short canon. Or accept the, uh, he calls them the Apocrypha, but the Deuterocanonicals, because the hi the history of canon and the theology of canon seem to be in the longer form, um, and part of it is, uh, part of his argument is, Christianity inherits an open canon from Judaism. Judaism has not closed their canon when Christ founded the church, and so the decisions of the rabbis, sixty years after the death of Jesus don't bind a church that's already been around. And so what, what we as a Christian community look at in terms of the Old Testament makes a difference. And how we've approached those over the years means that we can justify using these texts. Yeah. So. That's interesting. Let me add, let me add a little, uh, another question to that. Sure. I'll just tack it on my own. You know, it's interesting. I was reading they, you know, several years ago, as you know, they discovered a uh, Hebrew writing, which was in one of the Davidic cities, which was 200 years or something earlier than they thought. At least it was like yeah. 11th century, you know? And they, at first they, they was, uh, I think they had trouble. The, the, the Hebrew archeologists had trouble deciphering it, but then they worked out the loan word yeah. or something. And, and so you'd look at like external criteria like that, or like internal criteria of say the book of Exodus, where there's so much history that it gets right. And you know, how that, how, uh, you know, the, how the Egyptians made bricks and the geography of the Sinai and uh, that, you know, the, the way that uh, the hierarchy of slave uh, overseeing in, in Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how much should we try to, you know, kind of use these tools of internal and external criteria to try to, you know, kind of really kind of dig in on this Old Testament uh, canon, this, the, uh, the authority of the authenticity of the Old Testament ca canon, as opposed to also what you were saying, this, the, you know, the mind of the church. I think, I think it's a good apologetics tool in yeah. terms of, okay, now that we have, I mean, it's, it's part of the, I mean, that's what theology is about, right? It's fetus, quirons, and delectum, faith seeking understanding. Okay. So if we have the, the data of the church and it's been settled since Trent, what books are canonical and what are not, then you go back and you look at these things and you say, okay, well, what, what other data can we use to kind of say, yeah, it was right for the Israelites to keep this as an accurate, you know, and so it helps bolster kind of the back end of why they were accepted over the years, not simply the working of the Holy Spirit, but that they really did speak to something true. Um, I think it has value on that end. Um, and, you know, some of those archaeological uh, finds are kind of interesting. Um, the one that I kind of like is, um, and I, I wish we had an English treatment of it, and I, I don't trust my um, my writing, my my reading of, of ancient Hebrew to, to puzzle this one out. Um, but there's a, it's called the Revelation of Gabriel. Have you heard of this text? No. Uh, it's a two-column ink on stone, uh, pre-Christian inscription, um, and it's a. The authenticity, it just popped up probably about 20 years ago, but nobody's questioning its authenticity. So it's, it was kind of in a, in a private collection for a while, but nobody, it's not a forgery in other words. Yeah. And the first column is the Archangel Gabriel speaking to the Messiah. And that's pretty much locked down. Um, there's no debate on that. The debate comes in the second column where the, the, the angel looks at the, at the uh, Messiah figure and says, Oh, and by the way, you will die and after three days live in the imperative. And so a dying and rising Messiah, pre-Christian idea of a dying and rising Messiah, would have seemed foreign to most scholars 30 years ago. 
yeah. this text is actually showing us that there's at least somewhat of a tradition within Judaism. It's a minority position, obviously, that was that's kind of in the undercurrents before Jesus even comes. So there was a, ter- a current that he was building on. Um, he wasn't. This wasn't just simply out of the blue. Now, how widespread it is, we don't know. It's one text that's kind of tricky to to parse. But you know, that's where that's where things get really interesting in historical finds. Mm-hmm. So that's that's. I'm, I'm glad I didn't know about. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. And I'm glad you brought that up because you had mentioned Brant Petrie earlier, and and that's it seems to me a great example of how rich Second Temple. Judaism is for, you know, study when it's done in light of faith. For example, yeah. in the beginning of, of his book, um, The Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, where he talks about, yeah. well, it's not, it's simplistic to say that, you know, Jews were just simply waiting for the kingdom as a political reconstruction or something. Yeah. It was actually way more complex than that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And some of the stuff he's done in that book are just, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Dr. Summer, thank you so much. This was, I mean, sure. I, I'm, I'm so glad it was, it was a great topic. It was, it was a perfect, uh, a fourth lecture, you know, Dei Verbum 12. It, we can't talk enough about it. And, uh, it was, it was, uh, really fun to have you. And, um, I, uh, I yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. So thank you very much. And right. uh, we will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, sir. You're very welcome. Thank you.